Good morning, everybody. Uh, so, what I thought we'll uh, you know look at polymorphisms. Uh, then, what are the differences between synonymous and non-synonymous polymorphisms? And then, how this was a groundbreaking uh, first observation showing that the silent mutations also have effect on the function of the protein. So, I thought I'll show you this as an example how. And now, in the last 10 years, uh, you know, many more papers have come out of other enzymes as well as receptors, transporters. This has been shown. And then the most, one of the other studied polymorphism, which was identified using the genome-wide association linkage studies. And then, so normally, the way of research is done is you first develop or understand mechanisms in the laboratory, then you go to the bedside. But now, more and more, as you'll see, you have the observations from the clinic, and then you come to the lab, understand the mechanisms, and you go back to the clinic. And that's this. Now, people are calling this as the reverse bed to bench approach. And I thought I'll show you that one of the examples. So what are actually the polymorphisms? These are single nucleated uh, polymorphisms, or, or SNP. So this is nothing but a mutation which is occurring in nature. So we make mutations in the laboratory by changing right, amino acids. If we want to change, we make the mutations. But here, in the populations, this happens in nature. Either this could be hereditary, uh, environmental factors, as well as diet, other things. And so the most of them are, the, you'll hear the term SNPs, which is the single nucleotide polymorphism. So when you, so you have a three base, you know the letter codon for each amino acid. And if you make it even a single base change, you could change the amino acid that is incorporated into the protein. Or there may not be change in the amino acid. So even there is a polymorphism of the base, which does not lead to change to the amino acid, it's called synonymous or a silent SNP. And when you have a change in amino acid, it's called non-synonymous SNP or polymorphism. So that's the difference. One where you have a change in amino acid, one where you don't have a change in amino protein. Then you will also hear terms like haplotype. So what is the haplotype? Haplotype is nothing but having in the same gene more than two or three SNPs. So it's not that each time in a polymorphism you will have only one single nucleotide SNP polymorphism. You could have a combination of two or three and then we'll see one of the example of the haplotype in peak glycoprotein where you have three of changes but two of them are silent one has changed in amino acid, okay? So, so far in MDR1, this is the gene or ABCB1 which encodes peak like a protein. There are 150 SNPs uh, have been reported. And out of those, 25 to 30 of them are synonymous or silent mutations. Five common coding polymorphisms, uh, which are listed here, have no demonstrable effect on drug transport function. So although you have these changes. And then the synonymous SNP in exon 26, this is one of the most common uh, SNP which is studied was first the uh, variant to be associated with altered PGP function. It was found that patients having this SNP had a lower expression in intestine. And that's how the linkage was made uh, to this SNP. So if you look at now the distribution of SNPs in pig like a protein, this is the 2D model and you can see the, these circles which are red circles shows you that you have the SNPs throughout the molecule which are distributed. And then one of the haplotype that is most studied is this C1236T, G2677T and C3435T where the first one uh, is actually the amino acid 412, uh, which is here. 
the second one is 893 which is about here you can see the circle one this is 412 uh, 893 and then the 1145 is the C345 but there is no change in amino acid here or in 412 it 893 glycine is changed to either serine or threonine but that alone has no effect on the function so mostly this is the haplotype which is studied that was on the two dimensional model you can now see based on the homology model of the mouse pig like a protein structural this uh, you don't need to worry about the list but they're all uh, you know uh, spread throughout the molecule but there are a couple of regions here which are called intracellular loops so you have transmembrane helix then it's connected to the nbds by these intracellular loops bo on both sides and what we found is that there are actually clusters of this purple ones that you see are the polymorphic changes and interestingly when you make a mutation next to these polymorphic residues like this aspartate 164 or aspartate 805 the protein is retained in endoplasmic reticulum it does not come to the cell surface but if you use chaperones, the way we discussed about cystic fibrosis protein, the same chaperones will bring these proteins to the cell surface, and then it, they become functional. So one of the hypotheses is that maybe when you have these clustered polymorphic changes, they may have a role in the proper folding of the protein and then trafficking to the plasma membrane. So, there are many studies in the last seven years where you know, people have looked at the patient population about the increase uh, in clinical research. And you can see the disease name where you have the epilepsy, breast cancer, HIV, AIDS, colorectal cancer, and the drug name, which have been linked to having effect based on what polymorphic changes you have. And one of the most studies is this C3435T. So, what are the features of the most common haplotype that has been studied so far? So, people have shown in patient population that there is a altered digoxin and fexofenadine or Allegra pharmacokinetics. Altered toxicity in transplant patients from cyclosporin A and tacrolimus because you know the rapamycin and cyclosporin A are substrates for pig like a protein because of which you have altered toxicity in transplant patients. And then you have altered incidence of Crohn's disease, colon cancer, non-small cell lung cancer, and Parkinson's disease. Increased risk of, uh, risk of for breast cancer and epilepsy. And then this is the study that I'm going to uh, tell you about, altered folding and substrate specificity when you have a silent mutation. This is what we did, um, although this was done 10 years ago, but this was the first study showing changes. So once you observe these haplotypes or uh, polymorphic SNPs in patient population, you need to then study them in the laboratory conditions. And those days, we used to use a vaccine virus as the expression system. So you, we discussed about baculovirus and HeLa cells. The same way you have vaccine virus, which you can use to infect HeLa cells and express your mutant and wild type and look at function. So this is again the similar principle. So you want to look at, okay, you, you have, in this haplotype, you have three changes. So initially, first we made those three individual SNPs. And then combination of the two of them at each time. And the third one is one where you have all three together. And then you look at the expression by using antibodies like C219 showing you know, this X3 means the haplotype, okay? And as you can see, there is no change in the ex total expression or even the cell surface expression. I explained to you this antibodies we use, MRK16, which deter detect the epitope, external epitope. So you can use HeLa cells after e expressing proteins you do not have to permeabilize the cells or anything. You can just add antibody and secondary antibody with FITC or PE, and you can 
detect. This is the flow cytometry uh, data with a histogram. So higher the fluorescence intensity, it shows you that there is expression. And in all cases, you can see their expression is similar, showing that the haplotype and others, these mutations do not have effect on the expression. But when you look at now the transport, uh, we can use multiple fluorescent substrates. We discussed almost as many as 20 to look at transport function. So here we use the body PV rapamil as the substrate. And when it gets pumped out, it will have the lower fluorescence, as you can see, this wild type. The PTM1 is the vector we, we use for vaccine virus. So you have no PGP there, so you have a highest fluorescence. And then this blue one where this is the haplotype showing it has a decreased efflux function when you use body p mill. The same you can use for, but if you have this transport, you can then use an inhibitor like cyclosporine to see how the inhibitor is inhibiting the efflux function. And as you can see here now, this is just the PTM1 uh, as well as the different single SNPs has no change. But when you use the haplotypes, some of them show, you know, differential inhibition by cyclosporine of the uh, here body PVRAP mill efflux. So this was first indication that there's some subtle changes in the effect of cyclosporine on the efflux function. So one possibility is that it could be because of the gene dosage. That is, if you have a higher the protein concentration in the pea glycoprotein in your cell, maybe that's influencing it. So how do we titrate the dosage? That dosage can be titrated by using less of the DNA when you transpect cells. So we did like three microgram, 10 microgram, 15 microgram DNA. And as you can see in all cases, you see the difference in the wild type and the haplotype, it still shows you the difference, suggesting that it's independent of the gene dosage. So this was the conclusion for these studies, which is functional studies show subtle but reproducible differences in substrate specificity and inhibitor sensitivity, especially when bit between wild type and the haplotype SNP position at 3435. We also have a variety of multiple uh, confirmation sensitive antibodies for this protein. So we wanted to see if there is a change in the confirmation of the protein, we should be able to detect with antibodies. Uh, and because the epitopes are external epitopes, you don't need to permeabilize the cells or any of those uh, manipulations. So 17F9 antibody, actually there is no change uh, MRK16, there is no change, but UIC2 monoclonal antibody, you can clearly see the difference between the wild type and the haplotype. Haplotype has much more binding, comparing, comparing it to the wild type. We also know that this antibody, if you pretreat cells with cyclosporine or other wind blasting substrate, it responds and gives you increased binding. So it's been known. Uh, that this antibody actually responds to conformational changes. Yes. yes. The antibodies are these are all monoclonal antibodies, yeah. but their epitopes are slightly different. Okay. And interestingly, this antibody has epitope. So this protein has like six extracellular loops because we have 12 transmembrane helices. But the epitope for UIC2 is discontinuous epitope. That means it also has a first extracellular loop and fourth extracellular loop. Whereas F17F9 is only on the first extracellular loop, the epitope. And MRK16 is slightly different. So because the UIC2 has a discontinuous epitope, slight conformational change can be reflected in binding of the UIC2. So now this suggested that there is slight or at least indication of change in protein folding. So the other biochemical method we use for looking at the change in conformation is you look at the trypsin sensitivity of the protein. You isolate the membranes 
and then subject to different concentrations of trypsin for um, cleavage and then look at the remaining amount of the full full length protein and trypsin cleaves that are at the end of the arginine or lysine amino acid so most of the cleavages are in either extracellular loops or intracellular loops because the transmembrane region does not have either lysine or arginine in p glycoprotein sequence okay but here what we are looking only is at the concentration of trypsin required for the degradation of pig like a protein of wild type or haplotype and as you can see clearly there is a you know difference and this you can detect this by western antibodies because you can this is the control and then you can see the trypsin concentration going from the 1 to 100 microgram and the goal was just to see how sensitive the proteins are and that showed that there is a change in the folding. So the polymorphic forms of PGP with alleles that don't change amino acid sequence change the conformation of PGP. That was the conclusion from these studies. In transient, because we use transient transfection experiments, the amount of PGP, mRNA, although I didn't show you the data for mRNA, protein and pro protein localization on the cell surface is unchanged. But the ability of PGP to pump some drugs and sensitivity to inhibition is changed. Confirmation of polymorphic PGP is altered as shown by triptych peptide analysis and confirmation specific monoclonal antibodies. And although I'm not going to show you the data, uh, we, just I'll see you, uh, show you schematic later on. But what we found is that if you do look at the toe printing of RNAs, there seemed to be major delay in translation at the site of silent polymorphism, which is the C3435. So when it's being trans translated at the ER level, for some reason, there is a delay. And the one of the reasons for the delay is, I'll show you. When you look at the, this SNP in all the populations, it's interestingly, if you find, so wild type, at these three positions, they use uh, frequently used codons because each you know, amino acid has multiple codons can be used. And then when you look at, so you, you use normal codons, which results in the wild type protein with norm, normal kinetics, you, the UIC2 binds properly, there is no change in the substrate binding site. But when you have the PGP haplotype, you use the rare codons for both all these three uh, SNPs. Because it takes time to search for rare, rare codons, we think that's the one that slows down the trans translation at the final stage for this 3435. And because of that, then you have the haplotype having altered kinetics of translation, giving you change in the binding of epitope for UIC2 as well as the substrate binding site. So what are the effects of the, the silent SNPs? So there is no change in amino acid sequence. The mechanisms can be the messenger RNA structure and stability is affected. Kinetics of translation where rare or altered codon usage. You can also have alternate spicing, but we know that this is not involved in for pig like a protein or the alternate spicing. So this is the route by which we are observing the change in fold, uh, the folding of the protein and the function. And these are the, the implications of these are some Mendelian or non-Mendelian inheritance could be explained by synonymous mutations. For PGP, the haplotype with synonymous SNPs could be selected in some populations. So this haplotype is actually very common, the C435 uh, in Indian population. Uh, it's not a, a wild type. And, but this study was done in Singapore of the in, Indian population, which was like staying in Singapore. But I don't know whether anybody has followed this with people in India. So synonymous SNPs may explain heterogeneity of individual responding responses to drug treatment, including cancer cell sensitivity, plasma level side effects. And that could actually explain why we have pharmacokinetic differences.
in some of these populations. Okay. If you have any question on this, these okay conclusions. Uh, we hypothesized actually that time that the use of a rare codon by the synonymous polymorphisms affects the rhythm of co-translational folding and insertion of PGP into the membrane, and this may alter the structure, the binding site for substrates and inhibitors. Synonymous polymorphisms, especially for transporters and pumps, should not be ruled out as having potential phenotypic uh, significance and these mutations may lead to significant genetic disease. So that was the uh, conclusion we had. So one of the criticism of this study was that we actually used a transient translation system. Uh, and you know, maybe there are some changes when you do transient transfections versus stable cell lines. So we went back to you know, try to develop stable cell lines of these haplotypes. It took more than four or five years to really get a cell line uh, selection where we finally we ended up using LLCPK1, the peak kidney cell line, because it has the lowest endogenous peak glycoprotein level. If you use MDCKs, which has a high level of dog PGP, we didn't want to have to, you know, the background interference. The same way the KCO2 cells as well as the others have higher levels but we found the LLCPK1 was the best one for this study. So there then you, what you do is you uh, use PCDNA vectors, you, you transduce the cells and then you have to select the cells. So we had to select the cells with G418 marker and then develop the stable cell lines. So stable, once you stable, uh, develop stable cell lines, you can maintain them, I don't know, forever if you want to or with the G418 selection. And that essentially, we were able to actually reproduce all the data that we had with the vaccine and HeLa cells, uh, not only the um, transport, but also this, this triptych uh, digestion in profile. We also did the site, because in transient expression system, we were not able to do the cytotoxicity assay. But now with stable cell lines, we were able to do the um, cytotoxicity assays and you know, we could see some of the differences with the haplotype and wild type. And then these are the flow cytometry data showing the differences. So essentially we were able to reproduce all the data and this is about the theory of translational pausing, might ex how that could explain. So this is just a schematic showing the wild type protein and that's the like chaperone, this is the area where 3435 SNP is present. And when it's coming through reading, this is where the, you know, the difference may be because of this loop structure pausing the translation. And now with the RNA toe printing, this has been sort of confirmed. And uh, since then, many enzymes where this feature has been shown. Uh, yesterday, actually, we had Dr. Santosh Dixit, who was here. They just had a study um, where they were reporting in Indian Express yesterday, where a male, 65-year-old male, has uh, diagnosed with breast cancer. And that's because of the silent mutation in BRCA2 gene. Okay, in their case, they don't have the chain protein. They, they think, at least this is the unpublished data, showing that maybe there is a um, stability of the messenger RNA uh, issue rather than making the full protein. But that's a, the latest example where silent mutation has been shown to affect cancer. So now, last few years, you know, 10 years, people now have approaches to, different approaches to look at this. And one of the approaches, because of the human genome sequence and easily able to do the high throughput gene sequencing, you know, people use genome-wide association studies, GWAS. And this is what I just told you, the completion of the Human Genome Project and the International HapMap Project in 2005 this provided a set of tools to find the genetic contributions to common diseases. 
to carry out a genome-wide association study, two groups of participants are needed. So you have to have either up to more than 100 or 200 control patients and those with the disease. And then you obtain DNA from each participant, survey each participant's genome for selected SNPs. If certain genetic variations are found to be significantly more frequent than the people in, uh, in people with disease compared to people without disease, the variations are said to be associated with the disease. This just shows you the association or linkage. It doesn't prove that this is what is happening. But it sort of gives you a new, new tool to look at what the SNPs have effect, okay? And the most, the, I just wanted to show you, this is the uh, very recent study about genome-wide association studies of gallbladder cancer in Indian population, done by at Tata Memorial at, in Mumbai by Dr. Um, Rajesh Dixit and his team. Actually, he will be here tomorrow. Uh, he's going to meet, and if he has time, maybe he can share his findings with us. But interestingly, what they found is two of the ABC transporter genes, the ABC B1 and ABC B4, are very um, have a close association with the gallbladder cancer. Um, they have actually screened, I think, patients more than 1,000 or 1,200 patients with gallbladder cancer for this study, okay? And this was published in Lancet Oncology. Similar SNPs are also present in other ABC transporters. So I won't, I'll tell you one of the uh, SNP, which is most studied in ABC G2, because as you know, ABC G2 is also linked to drug resistance in cancer. And interestingly, we, we, we already looked at all this, uh, the topology as well as the functions. I also told you that ABC G2, it can, you know, is expressed in the stem, stem cells and many people use this as a stem cell marker. And yesterday we were discussing about hypotonic, I mean hypoxic defense mechanisms, the alpha hip, uh, hip alpha gene linked. So uh, polymorphisms in ABC G2 the ABCG2 expression is associated with an individual susceptibility to certain drug-induced side effects. A natural, naturally occurring variants have been identified, and one of them is this Q141K that has effect on the function and expression of the coded protein. Uh, the fun frequency of many functionally variant alleles is ethnically dependent, and we'll look at that, how the distribution is. And there is increasing evidence that ABC G2 SNP analysis is a strategy that can aid in predicting systemic exposure to substrate drugs, especially the bioavailability. So this is again showing you the 2D model of ABC G2 and non-synonymous polymorphic changes. So you can see how many polymorphic changes you can so far have been reported for ABC G2, uh, but the most studied is this glutamine to lysine 141, which is in NBD1 or ATP binding site 1. I mean, there is, in this case, there is only one binding site because the protein function, functional unit is a dimer. So when you have a, this mutation, actually, in, when you have a dimer, you are going to have the two mutant species because that's how it is, okay? So what do we know about this Q141K SNP? Uh, there have been many studies. So prostate cancer patients with the wild type ABCG2 genotype had increased survival as compared with those with Q141K ABCG2. You can see 5.3 years except uh, instead of 7.4 years. Intracellular accum accumulation of furfurbide uh, metabolite was 80% higher in HEK293 cells transfected with the, this SNP mutant than in wild type, confirming that the SNP decreases transport of fear by day and increasing that increased exposure to this metabolite may decrease survival. The cell surface expression of Q141K can be increased by pre treatment with chemical chaperones. We looked at this because if the mutant is retained in endoplasmic reticulum, you can bring it to the cell surface by using the chemical chaperones. 
It appears that the mutation causes folding defect similar to delta 508F in CFTR. We talked about this as, you know, similar mechanism where in cystic fibrosis, 70% of the patients have this deletion. But when you, they are treated with chaperones, you bring the protein to the cell surface and you reverse the disease effects. The interaction of substrates with Q141K is altered. This is based on the ability of substrates to compete with photo cross linking with the presocin analog, thereby affecting the ability to transfer substrates. And this is the most recent observation. So when people did the GWAS studies with ABCG to Q141K, they found that this is linked to actually gout. And I'll show you that. And in gout, what happens is you have the uric acid, the, uh, the metabolism of uric acid is altered. So mostly the no usual concentration of uric acid is in blood is about 300 micromolar. And then when it's being filtered uh, through the kidney, in apical, the epithelial cells, you have transporters, the OAT or others for the anions. You also have the sodium dependent urate transporter and then urate one, which will bring in the uric acid and anions in exchange for anions, okay? So gout is a disease hallmarked by elevated levels of uric acid in the bloodstream which can be caused by foods with high purine content, the body creating too much uric acid itself or body's inability to excrete uric acid. Crystals of monosodium urate or uric acid are deposited on the articular cartilage of joints as you can see some of these uh, tendons and surrounding tissues. It is marked by painful attacks of acute arthritis initiated by crystallization of urates within and about the joints. And the family history of gout usually passed down through the mother can predispose individuals to high uric acid levels. And the GWA studies showed that, you know, you have high the serum urate levels recently identified the multiple SNPs in a genomic region on chromosome 4 containing ABCG2 gene associated with serum urate levels and prevalence of gout. And then meta-analysis of GWAS scans from 14 studies, including more than 28,000 participants, resulted in identification of 954 SNPs, okay, of which the Q141K SNP is one of the novel ones. So you, you can see how many SNPs were screened, and then you, you identified the Q141K SNP. And then as we were discussing, once you find this linkage, you need to express this in, you know, your cell line model or in animals and then do. So these studies were done uh, by uh, William Gugino at Johns Hopkins uh, Medical School. So they expressed the wild type ABCG2 and the Q141K um, SNP. And then they looked at, directly showed that yes, ABCG2 use a urate transporter because you know that's what you would expect and that there is a decrease in urate transport when you have the Q141K okay and this this is the actually first A is the U uh, oocyte expression system and then they looked at the cell lines and this is the LLCPK cell line the same cell line that we use for PGP and as you can see this is by confocal, you can show the expression of ABC G2 on brush border, which is the apical membrane. And that's how they showed then that the mutant, uh, and they, these are just controls to show that it's a, indeed ABC G2 because FTC is an inhibitor, you increase, in, in, you know, inhibit the efflux. The, QA141K SNP results in reduced urate transport. Again, it's just showing the same uh, that we saw. Because here, when you have a efflux of the urate, you, your steady state level is low. But if you do not have the transport of urate, your steady state level is very high. And that's what you would expect with the mutant. If it is not pumping out, it will have a higher level of urate compared to wild type. 
uh, then these were just you know again looking at the analysis of the GWAS with the p values uh, and then they also looked at the Caucasian population as well as African American populations and there is a significant difference and many studies like these have been done even like a Japanese population uh, they have more than 25 percent of population has this Q141K SNP and we'll come to that and this is the model for how the ABC G2 may be um, you know transporting urate and if the Q141K uh, mutant doesn't come to the cell surface then you would expect urate accumulation into the kidney cells and that seem to be the mechanism how this transporter is linked to gout and now there are you know attempts to see whether you can use the rescue of the abc g2 to cell surface by chaperones can reduce the severity of gout uh, and those are the clinical trials going on on that what yeah Well, it's one of the transporter for urate. There are others, but they don't seem to be contributing that significantly, at least in gout condition. And another thing, it gets accumulated yeah. in the kidney. How it gets transported from kidney cells to the joints? So, because you have the other um, transporters on the bloodstream side, and that seems to, you know, then remove the urate from the cells to the blood. And then why actually only it goes to the, you know, the joints is not known. Or maybe there are some receptors or whatever, which, uh, you know, leads to the accumulation. But those studies, I don't think anybody has looked at that. But, okay. So what is the clinical significance of PGP and ABCG to polymorphisms? As you can see, it will have the effect on bioavailability, uh, ex CNS exposure because of the blood-brain blood barrier. Again, as we looked at all different mutations or whatever, these SNPs are expressed throughout the body. There is no tissue-specific expression of SNPs. So you're going to have the effect in, in an entire uh, body system wherever these transporters are expressed. And that's why you have this effect on bioavailability because of intestine, uh, CNS exposure because of blood-brain barrier, and then finally the tumor resistance when you have overexpression leading to drug efficacy and toxicity. And that's the reason why we say that now people should look at these SNPs in ethnic populations before selecting them for clinical trials. So I just mentioned to you earlier that this terminology that reverse translational research of ABCG2 in human disease and drug response. So what is reverse translational research. We just looked at the examples where we have the polymorphisms in patient populations. You bring back to the lab, you verify their association by studying the function and say, okay, this is the defect, this is the cause, or it could be one of the causative. But now, you know, people have started using this term, so the bench to bedside translational approach fails in one key area the discovery and development of new drug therapies. So the value of death, uh, valley of death refers actually in pharmacological field, this is commonly used by pharma pharmaceutical industries about the valley of death. It refers to the large gap between number of potential drug targets identified through the laboratory research and number of new therapies on the market. Okay. And we, first day I told you that budgets of the top 10 pharmaceutical companies totaled more than $70 billion in 2016, but only 22 new drugs were being approved by FDA in the same year. So you can see the need for approval of new drugs. And these are some of the websites you can have the look at for additional information. So the leading cause of failure for, of drugs in phase two and phase three clinical trials is the lack of efficacy, followed by the lack of safety and market trend need. And that's where the reverse uh, translational research offers a complementary approach to traditional translational research. 
in reverse translation, the challenge for the researcher is to explain the obser observational data through detailed and in-depth mechanistic studies, reproducing clinical findings in preclinical in vitro or in vivo models. And that's what we, I showed you the examples. Okay? And the reverse translational research has shown that genetic variation of this of the one of the SLC transporter, OATP1, B1, and ABCG2 in both Asian and Caucasian patients contribute to the large variation in drug exposure response and, in, and regardless of ethnicity. This is the most recent uh, paper. So this lady, Kathleen Giacomini, is one of the leading pharmacogenomic person at the uh, University of California in uh, San Francisco. And uh, I, Uma will give you the PDF of this paper. You can look at it details. So interestingly now, what they did is they actually looked at this Q141K mutation of ABCG2 throughout the world population. And as you can see, so can you see the, these circles have a light pink regions? And depending on the percentage of the Q141K, that pi of the circle changes. You can see it you know, it's being more here, less here. And then throughout the Asia, this increases, showing that percentage of the population with this Q141K is much more, you know, here. And in India, I don't think this study is still has been done that extensively. <coughs> this could be Pakistan or even this Bangladesh, but we don't have much information. Now the next step, actually, what we need is what is called individualized medicine or precision medicine. So where you could have pre-screening of the patients for these kind of selected um, transporters as well as other enzymes and which are involved in uh, bioavailability as well as ADMI. And then you go from there to treatment. This, this is just, again, this was about the number of drugs, you know, from anti-cancer drugs, uh, tyrosine kinase inhibitors and everything, how they affect and how the ABCG2 could have a role in this. It's essentially almost the summary of this uh, whole study. But that's just to tell you that now, you know, as you go along more and more new different terminologies, you'll be able to be exposed. And reverse translational really studies nothing but what people already are doing. Uh, this is more just different version. And uh, so those are the two main case studies of the polymorphic changes and how they affect the drug availability and we should be aware. And the more studies like these are done, it will be more useful for treatments and efficacy, increasing the efficacy for chemotherapy as well as other drugs.